All right, everyone, welcome to our fifth section for CS164. Uh, today we'll be covering iOS's table views and navigation controllers, uh, which are some really common design patterns that you'll see in a lot, lot, lot of iOS apps. So learning how to use these will allow you to make some really cool applications that replicate a lot of the functionality you see on the apps you know and love. So today's agenda will be just conceptual overview of what table views are, um, then their relation to navigation controllers and a more robust way of navigating between views in an iOS app, and finally, just customizing these things to make them um, editable and change the styles to be uh, what you want them to be. So the table view is one of the most common things um, in iOS apps. Basically, if you've ever browsed your contacts list or your music or any list of items, that's a table view, um, whereby typically each item will have one row in the table. And generally, there'll only be one column, whereby on the iPad, there'll usually be a little column to the left and then a display thing on the right. Um, today, we're just looking at the single column um, list of items. So the way these things are implemented are, of course, using MVC. So if you got sick of it in project 0 and 1, I'm sorry, it's not going to go away anytime soon. So when you're dealing with a table view, you're obviously displaying some data to the user. So that data is going to come from some model. Now, the model doesn't have to be as formal as a MySQL database. The model could be as simple as just an array. And again, that model doesn't have to be in a separate class file. You could just have that array live somewhere in your view controller. But it is important that that data lives in some container that you can access in a deterministic way. So the view is a little more straightforward. That's going to be the cells in the table. Typically, you know, one cell is bound to one item in your model. And so that magic happens inside of the controller. So the controller, just like in PHP web applications, is going to say, I need to display some data from the view. I'm being asked for some data. I'm going to look into the model, pull out some data to the model, and pass it back to the view. And the view is actually what's going to display that data, um, in this case, a single row in a table. So in order to implement table views, we're again going to be using protocols. And this time, instead of the UI text field delegate or what have you, we're going to be looking at the UI table view delegate, um, which makes a lot of sense. So when iOS is ready to render your table view, it basically has a couple questions for your data source. So the first question it has is, how many sections are in your table? So when you're browsing music, you might notice that all of your artists or your songs are typically divided by letter. So every, every song that has, starts with the letter A would compose a section, and same for B, and so on. And most of the apps we'll look at today, there's just going to be a single section. So your answer to this question is usually one. There's just a single section in my table. So the iOS says, OK, now I need to know how many rows are in each of your sections. So the reason it needs to ask this is because it needs to know how many times to ask the model for the next piece of data. So if you say there are five rows in my table, then you're going to get asked five times in succession for what's the next row, what's the next row. So finally, once iOS knows how many sections and how many rows, so basically it knows how many questions to ask of your model through the controller, it's going to say, what does each individual cell look like? And it's there that you're actually going to format the data as you want and eventually return a UI table cell object that's actually going to be displayed to the user. So one thing you'll immediately note is that performance is immediately an issue. So when you're browsing your iPod that has something like 20,000 songs, it's probably not a good idea to load that entire table into memory. right? Because if you're at the top of the list, there's no real reason to have all the songs starting with x, y, and z loaded into memory for immediate access, because the user's just not going to get that far. So what iOS does is it basically maintains a buffer of cells that are maintained in memory. And generally, that will only be the cells that are currently displayed on the screen, and maybe you know, one before that and one after that for performance. You know, we don't really care about that level of detail. But what we do care about is that we're effectively caching cells. So rather than load the entire 20,000 20, song music library into memory, we're going to load them in in small chunks. So that means that once a cell has been allocated and loaded into memory, and I scroll away from it such that it goes off the screen, Rather than removing it from memory and allocating a new cell, I'm actually going to reuse that cell. So rather than um, create a new block of memory on the heap, I'm going to take the block of memory that I already have and just modify its contents. And that's going to be a significant performance gain. And if you had any long lists in your project 0 or 1, you may have found that jQuery Mobile was kind of annoying to scroll through huge lists. The reason being, the contents of the DOM, the whole thing was in memory. Now, with iOS applications, you don't really notice any performance hits with, as the length of the table view increases. And this is exactly why, because the entire table is not right now in memory. 
So in order to pull a cell from the cache, or basically ask the system, do I need to allocate a new cell, or can I use one? You're just going to you send this really simple, very longly named message, DQ reusable cell with identifier. And that's going to return one of two things. If it returns nil, that means that there are no cells already loaded into memory stored in the cache that you can currently use. So if that's the case, then you have no choice. You need to allocate a new cell. And you know, the first time that your table view is opened up, that's obviously going to need to happen a lot because there's nothing in the cache. But as you start to scroll, what this message is going to return is going to be pointers to blocks of memory that you can reuse, that are safely off the screen, um, and that you, as a developer, can take advantage of rather than allocating new cells. So looking at the result of this message is going to be a pretty common pattern. So you're, you'll see uh, that the argument for this last met for actually just that this last method is this thing called an index path. And an index path is a little bit strangely named, and it sounds complicated, but all it really is is a container. So basically a struct or an object that doesn't really do anything but contain two types of data. And that's the section that we're talking about and the row that we're talking about. And these are simply properties of the object. So I would say index path dot row, and that's going to tell me exactly where in the table that I'm trying to render this cell when I say cell for row at index path. So basically, this eliminates the need for me to say section and row. I can just collapse those two things into this single container object. So keep in mind that the index path contains nothing more than this numerical section and this numerical row. The index path has absolutely no idea what data you're dealing with, how big it is, what's contained within it. It's just basically a location into your data. So in order to actually map some index path to the data that's going to be displayed, you probably want to do something like this. You have some model. You're going to send it the message, object at index, which is effectively just indexing into an array. And in this case, I'm going to say, I want the current row. And in dealing with the single section application, this is probably what you're going to do most of the time. So that's on the model side. So on the view side, the cell object, which is a UI table view cell, has a couple properties that we're interested in. So first, the text label is a UI, uh, UI label. And that's basically just the text that's displayed inside of, the, inside of the cell. So this is no different than the labels we've seen uh, when we were making our Hello World apps or even a very simple list last week that didn't use a table view. Uh, it's just a very standard UI label. You can change the color if you want. These are all very straightforward properties. But we also have this other thing that's helpful a lot of time called the accessory type. So depending on the apps you've used, you may have noticed um, kind of a gray arrow to the right of a row, or a blue button to the right of a row, or even check marks or other indicators. And this is how you're going to be implementing that. You can basically just say that every cell has an accessory of like a, uh, a disclosure indicator, which is that little arrow. And then every cell on the table is going to have that. So that's pretty simple. So let's take a look at actually creating a table view. So I'm going to say new project. And first, I'm just going to pick a single view application. Later, we'll look at this master detail application, uh, which used to be called the table application. They've changed it to master detail just with the rise of the popularity of the iPod, of the iPad. But for now, we're just going to click on single view. Uh, we'll click next. We'll say table view in class. And we'll save that somewhere on my computer. OK. So here's our project. OK, so again, right now, we just have this very simple view. So we don't want a regular view. We actually want a UI table view. So the first thing that we can do is delete that. So we don't care about that view anymore. We instead want a UI table view. So to find that, I can just come down here to the bottom right and start typing in table, and I see a table view. Not a table view controller. That's something different that we'll see later, but just the actual view. So now, once I drag and drop that, you can see over here, table view is listed as an object in this nib. So let's save that for now and come back to the view controller. So as we saw in class, we actually have a special case of a UI view controller that's devoted just to table views. And it is predictably called the UI table view controller. So again, this is just a subclass of your typical view controller. So it can do anything that the view controller can do, plus a little bit more. So because we just added some object into our nib, that suggests the first thing we want to do is create an outlet for that, uh, for that uh, table view so that we can access it from our code. 
So let's just do that. We'll say property, typical attributes. We don't really care about any multi-threading or anything like that. So because we're going to be connecting it in Interface Builder, we're going to say IB Outlet. And what we just added was a table view. And we'll just call it table view. So that's done in my uh, interface file. So I come over here to my implementation. And I, of course, just need to synthesize it. So I'll say table view. We're going to use the instance variable, just the default underscore table view. I can just get rid of these comments, because I don't really care about that. OK. So now let's come back to our nib. So we now need to connect the property we just made to this nib object. So to do that, that's pretty simple. We're just going to hold down Control click, come over here to table view. And the outlet we want is table view. Now, we mentioned before that we're going to be using this UI table view delegate. So that suggests a couple things. So first, that that delegate has to be implemented by the UI table view controller. So that means that by saying I'm a subclass of the UI table view controller, I am also implementing that delegate, because that's just defined in this class for me. So I don't need to add anything there. But what I do need to add is where the delegate is. So that's not defined for me. All I've said is this table view thing is this object here. What I haven't yet said is where the delegate for this table view is. And recall that the delegate is the object that's going to receive all of the messages that are sent by the table view. So that number of rows in section, the self or index path, we need to know where to send those messages. So if I click on my table view here, and come over to the side, you see that I have two outlets here that are not connected. So I have a data source and I have a delegate. And in both of those cases, I just need to connect those to my UI table view controller class. So that's done. And so one last thing, you'll notice that the first thing I did was delete that existing view. And so right now, this view controller doesn't know what view to display like as its root view. So we just need to reconnect over here this outlet for view over to the table view that I just put on. And the only reason that's necessary is because I deleted that top level UI view. Had I not done that, this wouldn't be necessary. But you need to make sure, and this can be the cause of a lot of crashes, um, that most of the outlets that you think are relevant over here are actually filled in. So data source were good, delegate were good, and view were good. So if I just run this app, We just see a blank table view, and that's good to go. So that means that we've connected all of our outlets correctly. So now we can start to actually populate this with some data. So as we mentioned before, the first thing we're going to need is some actual data to be displayed. So let's create that, a container for that data, here this, and this time using a private property, because we're inside of the .m file. So anyone who wants to use my view controller is not going to have access to this. So I'm going to say, uh, let's just create an NS array this time, because it's the simplest container for data. And I'm going to make an array of TFs. So after I've created the property, the first thing I need to do with it is synthesize it. So it's able to be used. And now, after we've synthesized it, we're going to actually initialize it. So in this case, let's just populate it uh, with some arbitrary data. So if we say self.tefs, oh. And we'll set that equal to an array object, because that was, the, that was the type we declared. And we'll just populate it with a list of objects, like David, Tommy, Rob. Make sense so far? OK, so now let's answer those three questions we mentioned. So the first question was, how many sections do we have? So if I start typing int here and say number of sections in table view, this is going to auto-complete for me, because I'm using the UI table view controller class, not the UI view controller class. In this case, I'm just, I just have one section, just my main section. Next question we wanted to answer was how many rows are in each section. So if I start typing table view number of rows in section, you can see it's telling me uh, what section I'm currently in. But that's totally irrelevant, because I only have one. And the answer to this question, how many rows do I have, I could just hard code in three, but that's kind of a bad idea. So instead, I'm just going to say the number of rows is going to be the number of objects inside of this array, because each object has its own row. So I'm going to say self tfs 
count. And that's just going to be the length of the array. So finally, uh, the most important question to answer is going to be, what does each cell look like? So I'm returning a UI table view cell and using this message, cell for row at index path. So just looking at the sample code for this might be a little cryptic. So let's actually walk through the process of pulling something from the model and displaying it in the view. So you'll notice the, one of the first things that iOS does is it creates some identifier. And this is just a string. Um, but this is the variable name they use in all of their templates. And this just provides a way for you to be able to store multiple types of cells into the cache. Right? It could be the case that not every row in your table looks the same. Some could have images. Some could have different colors. So you wouldn't want to reuse the wrong type of cell. So by giving each cell a, a different identifier or descriptive variable, that allows you to only reuse the type of cell that you need to reuse, or that you're, the type of cell that matches the cell that's about to be rendered. Um, so I actually don't have more than one type of cell in this case. So I'm just going to reuse the same identifier for all of them. So now, remember, the first thing we're going to do is try to pull my cell from the cache. So I'm going to say UI table view cell, cell is going to be not that, DQ reusable cell with identifier. You notice that I'm asking the table view for the cells it has in memory, and we'll just pass in the string I created. So now I have two cases. The first case is that the cell is nil, which means that there's nothing in the cache. So what I need to do here is I need to actually allocate the cell. So I'll say, UI table view cell alloc. And we'll say init with style. We'll just give it a default styling, so we're not doing anything fancy there. And again, we're going to tell the cache what the identifier associated with this cell is, so we can actually cache it. So now at this point, I definitely have a cell, right? Because if this did not return nil, that means that this cell is an allocated object that I can use. And if it did return nil, that means that I just allocated the cell. So again, we're good to go to use it. So if I say uh, cell.textlabel, you notice this is a UI label, and I can set its text property to be tf's object.index, index path.row. So the text displayed in this cell is just going to be the nth tf that's inside of my model, and now I can just return it. So any questions on how that worked? So I run it, and as expected, everything is displayed. Make sense? OK. So let's move on to some examples that are a little more complicated than that. So thus far, we've only basically seen views that are presented modally. Inside of the flip side view controller, <coughs> we basically um, switched to another, the other side of the app effectively. So I didn't really have a hierarchy of views. I just had one in the front, and I had one in the back. So the UI navigation controller basically allows you to maintain a stack, not a queue, but a stack of all the views that I've seen so far. And the effect that allows me to achieve is to effectively create a drill down application, where I can start looking at all of my artists. I can drill down to the albums of those artists and eventually click on a song by that artist. So the two, some, for some reason, asymmetric message, messages we're concerned about uh, is pushing a new view controller onto the stack. And you can animate it if you want and popping a view controller from the stack, which will eventually return you to the view controller that was before it. So this navigation controller property, which is of type UI navigation controller, is actually already a property of any UI table view controller. So there's no need in Interface Builder to drag one of those over or create a property. It just already exists because it's a property of the class UI table view controller. So this is there for you, and it's effectively a manager for this view stack. So uh, this is where you're going to send the message to push and pop. So you also have given to you the navigation item, which is basically just the top taskbar. So if you want to add buttons to that, change the text, um, the navigation item is where you can do that. And built into you, again, are the, the middle text there as the title property. Then you have a left and right bar button. So let's say now that you're ready to push a new view controller onto the stack, and therefore switch to it uh, while, main, while creating a back button. So there are two ways that I can push a new view controller. The first is from Interface Builder. So if I wanted to, I could create a new outlet for the object. And you'll see that in Interface Builder, we have, like this here, an actual controller. So this isn't something that will be displayed um, actually on the screen of your application, 
but I can have an outlet to a controller so I don't have to worry about allocating it and knitting with nid name and all that other programmatic stuff. Um, so that's one way to do it. You could also just uh, use the method that we've seen so far, just create a new instance of the object via alloc, and then make sure you specify the nib name. Um, and both of these ways will work just as effectively. So let's take a look at an example of one of these drill down apps. So you'll see here that I have first the master view controller. That's because I created this no longer just the single view app, but we're moving up in the world to master detail applications. So everything is now a master view controller. It used to have a detail view controller. deleted that because I didn't need it. So this, uh, the master view controller here, again, where we did much of the, it's doing much of what we did in the last example, implementing a table view controller. And then we come into here. This should look very familiar. We're trying to pull itself from the cache. If it doesn't work, um, then we're going to allocate it ourselves. But the data source, in this case, is a little different. So now we're using, instead of just some hard-coded list of items, a plist or a property list, much like you'll do in project two. So the property list uh, should be stored down here inside of supporting files. So if I open up this fruits.plist, you'll see that I'm mapping uh, names of fruits here to what look like image names. And so you'll see here that I basically have added some images of fruits. Um, and these values just match their file names. So very similar. The number of rows in the section is going to be the number of fruits, uh, and so on. So let's just run this app and then explain what happens when you start to drill down. So once this is open, You'll see here that I have two controls. I can either tap on the cell, or I can tap on this button over here. And this is an example of that accessory type. This is called the Detail Disclosure button. And tapping on this sends a different message to the delegate as tapping on a row. So if I tap on a row, you'll see here that I've navigated to another view, but this back button up here was given to me by the navigation controller. So right now, I basically have a stack of two UI views. And if I want to pop something off the stack, I can just click this back button. And if I want to push something onto the stack, I can click a row. So you notice if I click on this detailed disclosure indicator, I'm actually doing something else, uh, which is just loading the web page for whatever I clicked on. So let's take a look at how those two interactions are handled. So the message that's fired when you actually tap on a row is did select row at index path. And again, this index path is just where you are in the table. So in this case, I want to switch to that new view controller. In this case, one I've called the fruit image view controller that just displays the picture. So in this case, we're actually doing this via code in the way that you're probably used to. So we're, creating a new, we're allocating a new instance. We're specifying the nib file that will be used by it. And then we're just passing it some data. So this view controller has a property called fruit, which is just a string. And we're passing it what we just clicked on. And it also has a path to an image. And again, we're just taking that key that was clicked on, and we're determining what value it's mapped to. So once we've passed all the data to this new object, we can now push it onto the stack. And when I say push view controller, that's what's actually going to transition me from the table view to that other view. So that's when you tap on a row. When instead you tap on that blue button, you'll notice that you're now sending a different message. This is now accessory button path, blah, accessory button tapped, blah, 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 blah. And so you'll see here that I'm actually not this time allocating a new view controller. Instead, I'm just passing it some data and pushing it. So where did this self.fruit web view controller this time, because I'm loading a website, where did that come from? So if we look at the nib file, you can see over here that I have a second object, in this case, a, the fruit web view controller. So sure enough, if I look at the h file, I have an instance of my other view controller connected via an IB outlet. So to do that, I came over here to the bottom right. I started typing in view controller, you can see here that one of the options is just a generic view controller. So that's nice, but I don't want just any view controller. I want to make sure that this outlet has the type of the fruit web view controller in this case. So to do that, if I come over here to this third index, you can see that I can actually change the class of this view controller. So where it used to be just a generic UI view controller, I can now specify another class that's inside of my application. So when this nib is initialized, or basically when the app is loaded, I've already allocated an instance of the fruit web view controller. There's no need for me to alloc and init with nib name myself. 
because iOS has done that for me. So that means that once I come down here, I'm totally free to use this without needing to tell it what nib to use, because again, that is something we specified, um, or anything else. So a lot of times, if you're just dealing with the same view controller and you don't want to type out this long alloc and there's just no need for this a lot of the time, it could be much simpler to just create an outlet for your view controller, even though it's not actually displayed on the screen, uh, but as a means of circumventing that allocation. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what that other, those other views look like, so here I'm utilizing a new UI view called the image view, and all this does is display some image. So as you saw, I basically drag and drop some pictures over into my application here. And when I, the view is about to be displayed, this view will appear. You'll see that I'm just taking this UI image view. And it takes, um, as a property, an image to display. And the image I'm displaying is just the one that has the same name as the, file that was, as the string that was passed in. So I'm literally passing in orange.jpg here. And this is the really easy way of just loading it. There's no need to deal with bundles or anything. This is just kind of a shortcut method. So similarly for the web view, again, we just have this full screen control. And this is now called the UI web view, which is, again, a new control here. And the way to load a web page uh, is a little bit longer than it needs to be. But basically, you're going to use this message, load request. And that request is going to take an NS URL request object. So in order to create this URL request, you need to supply a URL, which rather than just being a string, is its own NS URL object. So to convert from a string to a URL, you'll have to specify, uh, use this URL with string method. And so basically, in this three-step process, we go from request to URL to string. And so basically, we're just building a string here um, based on the value that was passed in. So after I say this load request, it's going to be asynchronous, which is really nice. Uh, that means that my app is not going to freeze while this request is happening. You'll notice, uh, I close it, you'll, you'll notice that if the page hadn't loaded yet, I was still free to press that back button. And that's because this is asynchronous. And in general, when you're dealing with requests to servers or APIs or anything else you might write, you want to focus on asynchronous things, because those aren't going to lock up your UI, which is really bad. So any questions on how I'm passing data among Table view controllers. All right, so perhaps the most useful app that I will write is another example of this drill down notion. So let me fire it up first. And this is more of an example of hierarchically organized data. So, what this app allows you to do is browse the websites of a number of Major League Baseball teams. So see here, the first level that I'm presented is just the highest level of structure in Major League Baseball, the league, the American League or the National League. So let's say when I'm looking for an American League team, so now you can see within the league, I have divisions. I have teams in the West Coast, East Coast, and the Middle. Uh, so if I select the best division, I'm now down to only the teams in that place. And I click it, and I can load up their web page. So this is kind of the primary use case for these uh, navigation controllers, basically hierarchical data that allows me to drill down to an arbitrary level. So I don't need to be concerned about you know, what view do I get back to or anything like that, because the stack is maintained internally for me. I'm just pushing a new view onto the stack. And when I hit that back button, I'm popping a view off the stack and returning to where I was before. So this is pretty straightforward um, and also a little bit redundant. So we'll just go through this quickly. But again, um, I'm loading in some data based on a plist. Uh, this time with my plist being a little more complicated than what we've seen so far. This time, rather than simply mapping um, strings to other strings or having a numerically indexed array, I now am using a dictionary here. So actually, browsing this plist is pretty much the same effect of, as browsing this app. You'll see the value of this dictionary here is another dictionary, and the value of that dictionary is another dictionary. And finally, I'm mapping these keys, which are team names that are going to be displayed to the user, to their abbreviation. And that's what allows me to very easily get their website. So when I actually load this in, you'll see here I'm doing the same thing. Even though this plist is a little more complicated, it's still basically a set of key value pairs, much like a JSON object, just a little more complicated this time. So I'm just saying, I'm same thing, knitting with the contents of file. There's the files listed, located, because it's just called teams.plist. So now here, much of all the same thing. I'm getting the key corresponding to the current row. 
displaying it. Um, but what's interesting is just what happens when I actually select a row. So here I'm allocating a new instance of the next controller. So keep in mind that once I'm at the, the first level, I'm going to move to the divisions next. So I'm allocating one of these, supplying the nib name, and now I'm passing into it what data I want to be displayed. So this second view controller here is not going to touch the plist at all. But what's happening here is I'm basically passing in a subset of the plist, or a smaller, kind of a, a whittled down version of the plist. So whereas before I had all the teams loaded, I'm now looking at the object just for the American League and sending in only those uh, teams that are inside of the league that I selected. So now when I look at this divisions property, which is effectively um, the container for all of my data, again, it's just a dictionary. When I look at this divisions property, although I'm doing pretty much exactly the same thing as far as my cell displaying is controlled, I'm only working with the smaller set of data. So basically, the divisions controller is trusting the previous view controller to only pass it the relevant information. And so that way, I'm only keeping around in memory what I need to. I can just kind of throw away the other teams I don't care about by passing in only this one value, so the other key is gone. Um, and that also means I don't need to read the plist again. So does that make sense, how we've kind of created this recursive structure? Yeah? Yeah, so it so looks like in this case we've just built um, each layer individually. And that was deliberate so that you could actually see how things are being passed to each other. But what you could do in this case is just create some generic table view controller that looks something like this. And you could just say, I want you to display this data, and here's the title I want. And basically, I could just reuse, keep reusing that same object rather than creating separate ones. Um, but this way, it was just purely pedagogical, so you could see like this is now divisions. The property is called divisions, and so on. But for design, you probably want to factor this out. And then this final one, again, is just full screen web view. Web views are awesome because JavaScript is awesome. Uh, and this is the same thing, how to load a web page asynchronously. Any questions there? OK. So by now, those, those standard cells are probably getting a little annoying because they're boring. So iOS actually has built in a lot of nice different cell styles. Um, here they are enumerated. Um, but these different values are passed into the constructor uh, when I'm creating the cell from memory, not when it's already been dequeued from the cache, but the first time I create it. And you'll see here, if we just open up an arbitrary table view, that one of the arguments to this method is init with style. And right, we've, for now, we've just been saying, just take the default style, because that's all I really care about. But what I could say instead is one of these values. And if I were to do that, I can do something like this. So this one. So again, we're just loading things from a plist. No need to do that again. But now, instead of saying, I want the default UI table view cell style or whatever, I'm now asking for a subtitle. And because I'm now using this style, that has actually afforded me another label inside of my cell. So this text label is, again, the main text of the cell. But inside of this style is this other label, this detail text label. Now, if I set this without a style that supports it, it's simply going to be ignored. But since this style does support it, that's going to allow me to basically display another label inside of my cell. Um, so in this case, we basically just have titles and subtitles. Um, but this second row here is coming from the detail text label. And I didn't have to do anything fancy um, with nib files or anything like that to add this nice arrow over here and get this native looking effect. And it, Tends to be the case that things Apple designs look pretty good. And so this happens to look pretty good without me knowing anything about design. If I were to change this instead of def uh, subtitle to something like, I don't know, arbitrarily value one, which also happens to support the detailed text label, without changing any of my code at all, all I've changed was that one argument. I've completely changed the style of my table view. And again, I didn't have to do anything. I didn't even have to change what property I was using. Um, so the text label and the detailed text label um, can be used a little bit flexibly uh, based on Apple's built-in styles. Uh, but let's say um, that I'm not satisfied with these built-in styles, and I really want to create my own cell that looks exactly how I want. So there are two ways, again, that I can do that. The first is from Objective-C. And we can, like last week, add views to the cell 
via code. I can say, I want you at these four coordinates. I want you to be this big. Uh, I want you to be this tall, etc. So this is nice because you don't have to worry about creating additional files. But it can get a little annoying when you're trying to get things pixel perfect. And there's also no real sense of visual layout. So there'll be a lot of running the code again, adjusting coordinates, running it again. So sometimes, particularly with some of these simple things, you might just want to actually lay out your cell in a nib. And so luckily, it's very easy to do that because provided for us in that bottom right hand list is a UI table view cell, which is basically just the container for the cell we want to display. So if I go into Xcode and I say, instead of new project, I come up here to new file as if I were creating a new class. But instead, if I come down here to user interface, I can create just this blank view and replace this with a UI table view cell. So so I've done that here. I've just created a separate nib file. So this nib file does not have an associated view controller. It's just a, its own self-contained um, user interface component. And here I just have two UI labels. I have one on the left that I've bolded and made a little bigger, and one on the right here. So in order to get this to work, you have to invoke a little bit of a cryptic incantation. So the first thing I need to do is actually define an outlet for the cell. right? Because we know that in order to connect some nib file to actual Objective-C code, we need to do so via an outlet. So here's the outlet for my cell. So now when I actually want to use the cell, this just looks kind of bizarre. So we actually need to manually load in the nib. So the reasons for this being that we're going to be loading this nib in multiple times. So just loading it once is not enough, because then we're going to keep reusing that same block of memory. We need to make sure that this nib, a separate copy of this nib, is loaded for every cell in our table. So to basically force this nib to load, we're going to send this message, load nib named. And we're sending that just to the bundle, just because there's really nowhere else to send it um, but the kind of overall container for our app. And we're loading this nib, and we're passing in the file name of the nib. Now, we're setting the cell to be equal to, whereby the cell, remember, is what's going to be returned and eventually displayed, equal to self.customcell. So you'll notice here that I never set self.customcell to anything. But this is actually being loaded in this method here. It's not immediately obvious, because you're not saying self.customcell equals or anything. Um, but this is not returning what was loaded, but it's loading it into the appropriate outlet. So that means that after I call this, I'm ready to use this outlet. But the next time that I try to use this outlet, I've already loaded it. And so iOS might say, well, you've loaded it. I don't want to load it again, which is exactly what we're trying to prevent. So to do that, we're going to clear out this property. So it's now nulled out, because up here, we've copied it into um, the cell. And so this means that because the outlet has now been nulled out, the next time I come up here and say load nib named, iOS is going to give me a new copy of the nib. So these three lines are weird looking, um, but all they're doing is forcing the nib to reload, making sure iOS uses a new copy of that nib, rather than trying to manipulate the same cell 100 times inside of my table. So now, once we have our cell, all we know is that it's a UI table view cell. We have no idea about its subcomponents here, because this is just a nib. There's no associated class. So in order to get at these subviews here, I've given them tags, much like we did in tic-tac-toe uh, and the ATM app, which was much less fun than tic-tac-toe. I've given them tags. So you see that this left label has a tag of 10. And I tend to start in double digits, because everything by default has a tag of 0. So relying on something to have a tag of 0 requires you to change every existing 0 to something else. So I always like to start at 10, because that's not taken by anything. Uh, and so the other label just has a tag of 11. So if I were a good programmer, I would have defined these values or made them constant somehow, but I'm not. So I'm just saying that I want to access the subview with the tag 10. And I just happen to know that this 10 corresponds to the left label. So you notice here that I need to cast this to a UI label, because this message here is just returning a generic pointer to a view. But I need to depend on this property called text being present 
And that's only present in the UI label, not the UI view. So just basically the need to make this view more specific, because I know it's a label. And then again, we're not going to do anything interesting here. We're just going to load one half of the plist into the left, then the other half of the plist into the right. <coughs> and when I run this, I'm basically going to be able to see uh, my custom cell inside of each of these rows. And you notice here that what's different about mine and the Apple one is that the size of this text is automatically resizing. So you may have remembered that Apple is just kind of truncated, uh, but it's just a simple property of the UI label that says, I want you to try to resize to fit the text rather than just truncating everything. So there's one other thing I had to do to get this to work. So I mentioned before that I had this outlet for a cell, but I actually need to connect this outlet somehow. Problem here now that we haven't seen before is that this is one nib file, and the outlet is in another nib file. And you can't just make arbitrary connections between nib files. So the interesting way of getting around this is to click on the files owner property of this nib. And you notice that this nib doesn't really have an owner. It's just in its own free floating around in the universe nib. But if I come over here, I can again change the class of it. So much like uh, we changed the class before, we can say that the owner of this nib file is going to be the master view controller. And that means that this nib file now recognizes all of the outlets that are defined inside of that header file. So if I come over here uh, to the connections manager, you can now see that this uh, custom cell outlet that's defined in masterviewcontroller.h is connected here. And I've connected it to the files owner because I've changed the files owner to be the master view controller. So it's a little bit interesting, but this basically means that these two nib files have the same owner, which allows me to share the outlets between them. Does that make sense? And of all the steps that are easiest to forget, that is probably number one, um, because it's just really sad when you're looking at all the outlets and the one you're looking for isn't there. So finally, to finish up, um, we're going to look at making table views editable whereby I can add new rows, I can move rows around, I can delete them. And again, messages are defined inside of this UI table view delegate to facilitate all of these processes. So I can first define whether or not a given row can be moved, whether it can be deleted. And then separate messages exist for what happens when a row is moved or deleted. So when we do this, we again can't forget about our favorite design pattern and be sure to update both the model and the view. So if a row is, for example, deleted, I can't just remove it from the table. right? So let's say I, delete, I have a table of three items, and I delete the middle one. So now the next time the user clicks on what is now item number two, I'm probably going to get information from the deleted cell if it still exists in my model. Because all the table is saying, well, I want the second thing in your array. And if the second thing in your array is still there, even, if it, even after it was removed from the view, you're going to have an inconsistency which can often actually lead your app to crash. If the, table, if, your, if the iOS is asking for 10 rows and you only have 9 in your model, um, that's just going to be a problem. So when either you move or delete a row, and also add a row, you need to make sure that you update both the model and the view. So uh, today's app, which is even more useful than Tic-Tac-Toe, is a to-do app. Uh, inspired by this app called Clear, uh, which you can see by the headline, uh, cleared, <laughs> Um, a quarter of a million downloads in a few days. And literally, all this thing is, is a table view. So here's a video of it. You can see that you just have this list of tasks. And by tapping them, you can add new tasks and remove them. And this, there we go. So you can kind of swipe up a little bit, add a new task. All he's doing here are very basic table view operations. So after this section, you are, you are ready to clear a quarter of a million dollars in a few days. Because that's all this app is using, the same thing we looked at today. They've just made it look a little nicer. Maybe that's why they got so many downloads. So let's stop being an ad for a startup and look at how they could have done this. So let's first take a look at the finished product uh, being my to-do list. So here you'll see I have two buttons, one that will allow me to edit and remove to-dos, and one that will allow me to add a new one. So I click the plus, and I've slid over here to my new uh, add task view, and I have to do something today. So I click Add, and you'll see I've navigated back here to something. If I want to delete it, 
I have that nice animation, and I click this, and whoo, everything fades in. I can delete it and fade it away, and that's really cool. And you'll be significantly less impressed once you see how much of that Apple did for me. So first, uh, we have two view controllers. The first is the actual table view. And the second of these view controllers is the one that allows you to add tasks. So I just have one method that I've implemented myself, and that's a method to add a new to-do, or basically what happens when I click that plus button. <coughs> so I've just created a container here for all of my to-dos. I've made it private because I don't want any other view controllers being able to manipulate it. And after I've defined it, I've, after I've declared it, I've defined it here with a synthesized statement, making sure to do this, which I always forget, allocate the array. And so now, inside of my view did load, this is where I'm actually dynamically adding those two buttons uh, to the top. And by me, I mean Apple, because when you uh, open up the master detail template, this is already done for you. Um, but let's actually take a look at what they did. So the first one is simpler. That button on the left is an edit button item. Um, and this is just defined by Apple for you. That behavior whereby when I clicked it, it switched to done, and all of the rows changed to have that like, uh, delete sign on the left, all that is done for Apple, uh, done by Apple, um, just by saying that I want there to be an edit, uh, edit button there. And that's it. The add button, on the other hand, is not something that's built uh, into, it's not, the functionality is not implemented for you. So to create a new button, the class I'm concerned about is a UI bar button item. I'm not, this is really redundant, but anyway. So I'm creating a new system one, because I'm, that plus is just a system icon. So if I want to utilize a system icon, I just need to make sure I say system here. So then this is the actual uh, icon, the system item add. It's just that plus image. So now, just like the UI alert view here, I'm supplying basically a delegate. So this is new syntax that we haven't seen before. So what this says is this is the action that I want to fire when I tap on it. So this is a little weird syntax of saying this at selector says I want this selector corresponding to this text here. So in this case, add to do is a message. So I want to convert that message into something that I can actually pass into uh, this message here. So this is kind of the equivalent of passing a function. If you've done that in CS51 or in JavaScript, because you can do that, you're basically passing in a function to this button so that this button knows what function to call when it's tapped. So the selector says which message to fire, but that's not enough because maybe I want to fire a message in another class. So this first parameter here, target, says which object do you want to pass this selector to? And this add to do is defined as an instance message of, instance message of this class, because we're using a minus sign. So here, I'm just going to say self. So the current instance of the UI view controller is going to receive this add to do message. So once that's all created, I'm just, again, adding this to the navigation item, that top bar, and I'm putting that on the right. So that's where those two buttons came from. So now let's actually look at this uh, add to do method. So we come down here add to do. So again, this is very similar. But we're going to be transitioning from this view to another view. So I'm going to allocate it. I'm going to specify the nib. And now we have a delegate here. This is interesting. We'll take a look at that next. But now we're just pushing it onto our stack, which slides over so the user can see it. So this delegate thing is interesting. So let's take a look at the header file for this add to do view controller. So you'll see here now that I'm being a good designer here, and I've defined a protocol that applies to this view. And this protocol is very similar to the one that we saw in the utility app with the flip side view controller. I'm saying that I, as a add to do delegate, as some class that implements this protocol, I need to respond to the message when someone finished adding a to do. So in this case, when they click that add button, they're done adding the to do. OK? So now this delegate, we're basically implementing ourselves now. We're saying that any delegate of this class needs to be anything that implements this protocol. So this is the kind of cool syntax to say this ID says I can be any type of object I want, but it has to implement this protocol. So keep in mind here, I could have just said for the purposes of this app that this was not an ID that implements this protocol, 
but it was just the master view controller. And I could just pass in the current instance of the master view controller. But this is a little more flexible, because if I ever wanted to have more views, all a view needs to do is implement this protocol method, and then it can interact um, with this view here. So the nib is very, very standard. There's nothing fancy here. Just label. These things have outlets. So now, you'll notice here that the code is very, very short. And I actually don't need any of this. But this button pressed method is, again, an IB action. Um, so I've connected that accordingly, declared that down here. And this action is fired when I press that done button. So you'll notice here that this is doing nothing more than sending a message to the delegate. This view is not hiding itself or updating the view behind it. It's sending a message to the delegate, much like the flip, the flip side view controller. When I pressed that button at the top to switch back, it did nothing more than send a message to the delegate. And so uh, this is a very similar use case and kind of a case in point for when you'd want to use a delegate. So I've implemented all of this myself. And it was pretty straightforward. I just needed to declare a property for the delegate. Then when I create the instance of the class, I need to specify the delegate by saying, I am the delegate. I want to respond to those messages because I have, in fact, implemented the protocol in question. Otherwise, I'd probably get a warning or at least something that doesn't work uh, when I tried to send that message from the add to do to the table view. And remember here to make sure that you import the header file that contains the relevant protocol defin uh, definition because I, Xcode's just not going to know what an add to do delegate is until you tell it. Uh, where it is declared. So that means that because I've implemented this delegate, that somewhere in here has to be this did finish with to do method. And this is very similar to what happens in the uh, utility app. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to update my model. I got sent back a string representing a task, and I'm going to add it to my list of tasks. So that's easy. After I update the model, I'm going to update the view. So when I just add something to the model, the table view is not going to be refreshed automatically. But refreshing is something I have to do manually. And that's via this reload data call. This just says, go through that process of sections, rows, and cell for row at index path. Just start over, run through that process anew, which means that that new object that I put in the model is going to be picked up and displayed by the controller. So finally, I'm saying that I want to come back to this table and remove the view that was pushed. So notice here that when I say pop view controller animated, that doesn't mean pop this one, right? Because I'm right now in the master view controller, which is the table. So when I say pop, I don't mean like, this doesn't mean pop the current one. This means pop what's at the end of the stack. So even though I'm in another class now, at the end of my stack is this add to do view controller. So when I say pop, that's going to bring me back to this class here. So the design motivations make sense behind all of that, how we're delegating the task of handling what happens when you add it to do to the table view. So the reasons for that being, well, what if I had, for some reason, more than one table view that added a task? And maybe the different table views responded differently. So maybe one displays it in a traditional table view, and the other one has the cell flash or displays it in some other manner. So I wouldn't want that functionality to be handled inside of the add to do view controller. Right? Because if I start tying this functionality to the master view controller, that limits the amount to which I can apply this to other view controllers and extend this same functionality by reusing code. So by simply delegating the task, saying, I don't know who you are, but whatever you do, you have to respond to this message and do whatever you want with this data. By doing that, that allows my implementation to be much more flexible, make it much easier for me to plug in additional functionality that uses this same view controller. And that's kind of the motivation um, for the delegate pattern uh, is not tying two views too closely together when they really don't need to be. Uh, that and it cleans up your code a lot. So finally, uh, you'll notice that the ability for me to add and delete tasks, add, delete, and move tasks was also implemented. And so really quickly, um, let's just take a look at the messages that we need. So we first need to say um, that I can move something. So we'll take a look at moving first. So I need to say that this row can be moved. I'm just going to say, yes, I don't care what row you're at. I want it to be movable. So after I say that it can be moved, I now need to handle what happens when a user actually executes the move action. So uh, let me actually just show you what that looks like um, so you have a better sense of what this does. 
I realized I did not do that before. Uh, so if we say I have to do something, and I have to do something else. So now I can actually pick this up and move it. And it's really smooth, transparent animation uh, of which I did nothing. So when I click Done, uh, the two things are that movement has been persisted. So this is a two-step process. I need to update the model, and I need to update the view. So this is just like back in CS50 when we're swapping two variables. Unfortunately, we can't like zor the rows together or anything, so we kind of have to do this awkward temporary variable thing. So we're first going to determine what was moved, and that's from the nicely named from index path. So this just says what I just moved. And so I just want to remove that from the model. Right? I don't want to try to worry about doing any like, fancy reordering. I just want to get rid of it and immediately reinsert it at the index it was moved to. So we're not actually moving it. We're actually removing it and inserting a new copy. But that's just much easier than trying to worry about weird swaps. So I'm inserting the same object that I removed here. And I mean, you can actually, in Objective-C, just insert at an arbitrary index in an array. So with this second at index uh, argument here, just says where I want to put it. So that should be pretty straightforward. Um, so also, <coughs> we are allowed to delete things. So delete uh, is basically an edit action. There's also built-in ways to add rows, and that would be another type of edit. Uh, but we're only looking at deletions here. So just like I said, I can move every row. I can delete every row. So just arbitrarily return yes. And so this commit editing style is going to be the message that's received when I execute a delete action. So because this can handle both additions and deletes and some other kinds of edits, I first want to make sure that the user actually executed a delete action. So they did. Again, two things. We're going to update the model. This time a little simpler. I just need to remove the object um, at the index that was tapped. So this time, we don't actually care what object was removed. We just care about where it was. So we'll just remove that. Then finally, uh, or next, we'll update the view, separate process. Um, I could have simply said reload data, but then I don't get that nice fadeaway animation. So to achieve that animation, I say delete rows at index path. This can actually delete multiple rows at once. Um, but in my app, you can only delete one to do at a time. So we just need to make this single object an array, because this parameter expects an array. Then we can say fade away. I'm sure there's some other cool animations that I can use and look really fancy without having to do myself. So any questions there? All right, then that's it for this section. So thanks for coming, and good luck getting started on Evil Hangman. <laughs>